On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1985. We're going to be taking a look at Daryl Hall and John Oates, and they're going to be performing Man Eater. <laughs> Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So let's get Daryl and John up on screen. And obviously this is a live version of Man Eater, so it is gonna be slightly extended to the recorded version, but we'll see if we can make our way through it. Let's see how they get on. I'm just going to jump in here. As always, the link to this video is going to be in the description below. So you guys can head there. If you want to watch the whole concert, you can. We're just watching a small segment of it with the performance of Man Eater here. But just to address that sax solo as well, this is top instrumental ability across the board. Listen out to the backing vocals as well. So solid and such an important part of this song. And this is the thing that Daryl, with his live vocal, just always nails it, always gives a record quality vocal live, but those backing vocals fill in so much of that sound and are so well executed. And the saxophone solo, by the way, has that really cool 
two beat delay on it and it's set around 75% to 80% in the mix of that delay. So it means that you hear the same sax line repeated back in that gap and it gives such a great effect. Daryl Hall and John Oates are an example of the rarest of things in the music industry, which is great songwriters and the way that they work together. They've got different influences and they meet in the middle ground so that they come up with something unique, but have also got that appreciation of melody so that they not only have one hit, but then they'd have another hit and then another hit. And most people would be happy with one hit in their lifetime, whereas these guys just seem to reel them off. Talking about the compositional elements and what Daryl and John put into their compositions, Maneater is a great example of a song that, that would probably be classed as pop or pop rock, very much in the mainstream and with that vocal delivery. But I'm sure a lot of you were thinking of other songs when you hear that bass line riff come in. It is classic Motown back in 1966, You Can't Hurry Love by The Supremes. Just listen to that bass. It's exactly the same bass line. It's got that swing and that bounce in there. Even Barbara Ann, that's another song. And a lot of people will probably know the Beach Boys version of that. But it's that ba 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 It's exactly the same groove and feel. But here, it's the way that that sound has been taken by Daryl and John and the groove and the feel, but then manipulated into this mainstream pop rock hit. And also, just to put that under the spotlight as well, the groove that we've got going on here. I'm gonna just play a quick beat on my MIDI keyboard here to give you guys the difference between that straight beat and that little bit of swing that comes in there. So I'm gonna play the beat straight to begin with and then play it with the swing and groove that we have in this composition second and hopefully you can hear the difference between the two. So straight we have. Like that and then with the swing. Like that. So you could hear that second time through. Because we have a foot pedal coming in on the offbeat, it just gives it that lift, that bounce, that excitement. And it takes that beat and the whole groove to a totally different place than if we were just playing it straight. And that's the point. It means that we've got this energy in the performance and to the song that wouldn't be there otherwise. It's not until you start analyzing things that you start to see this little link to a totally different style of music at a totally different time. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that if a rock band or a pop rock band came out in the mid 80s and said to the record label, we're gonna put a Motown feel in some of our tracks or in this one in particular, the record label will say, well, that's not gonna work because the mid 80s is all about big hair and rock and guitar solos and it's very much over the top. Whereas the 60s was a totally different time, totally different feel. But because of the ability of the songwriting, it means that they can take influences from all over the place and put their own spin on those influences to come out with something that is now original and unique. But obviously it is borrowing from previous generations of singer, songwriters and bands, musicians, but that's what great artists do. They study other musicians and are influenced by them, but then channel that through their own personality, their own tastes, and that's what makes it unique to them. Obviously, when you've got two great songwriters that put their heads together, there might be one that writes a song and the other one doesn't like it and vice versa, but it means that the writing process is so much more refined because of the quality control. They are writing a song collectively that they are tweaking so that they both like where it's going and how it sounds, which means once it gets released, it has been filtered throughout their whole taste and their influences individually, but then collectively. So it gets released and it appeals to a lot more people because it's already had to go through that process of being liked by two people with totally different tastes, totally different angles on that particular song. We are gonna be getting back into the performance, but just before we do a quick word on Daryl's vocals, because range-wise, he's in and around E4 and F4 here. He's so solid throughout, and he does touch on a B4 as well, just one note under that C5, that male tenor high C that I always mention. 
But he just throws these notes in there so effortlessly and puts on such a great show as well. And this is the thing that he's just got the mic and isn't playing an instrument even though he's a multi-instrumentalist. So he has that ability. And look out for that at the end. He does actually get behind the keys and also look out for the guitar solo, the extended solo from G.E. Smith on lead guitar. But let's jump back into the performance and we'll watch it until the end. And there we have it, complete with the super tight ending. This is such a great live sound they're getting, just so tight across the board. But everything that's in there, we've got obviously the extended version of the song because it is a live performance, but we've got the extended guitar solo. We've got so many different sites that we see on the journey with the shift in focus to the lead guitar solo, the saxophone solo, and just with Daryl's vocal as well. That groove that's in there, you could listen to that all day. The thing about Daryl and John with their live performances is the fact that they have the full band sound. They don't hold back. Everything that you want to hear in the mix is in there. It is something that I prefer personally when you're listening to a singer songwriter or a duo when they play live and they've released a record where in the studio they got down multiple takes and have a lot of instrumentation going on. When they play live, they get the full band involved and get sessions guys to play all of the parts that you hear on that original record. Sometimes it will be the opposite where they'll release a really full sounding album and then when they play live they might have an acoustic guitar, maybe a couple of acoustic guitars and that's fine. They'll do a different version of the songs but sometimes you just want to hear it how you know it. So with Daryl and John they just let it all hang out live and go for it. Don't cut any corners. And just to put the band name under the spotlight as well, because Hall & Oates, as people refer to them as, and that's what people will search for them as on YouTube, isn't something that they came up with as a band name, and it never really was their band name. It's always Daryl Hall and John Oates. So 
I don't think they wanted to be known as that, but it just happened to be easier to refer to them as that because of their surnames. But I do want to try and cover a little bit of their history and career in this video, even though it would take years to cover everything that they achieved. But they first met each other in the Adelphi Ballroom, and that's in Philadelphia in 1967, because they were both there with their own bands independently for a Battle of the Bands competition. But then gunshots started Started to ring out in the venue because there were rival gangs shooting at each other so they ran off and they both got into the same service elevator and they started talking and they realized that they had a lot of things in common and shared the same kind of taste in music they also realized that they both attended Temple University in Philadelphia so they started spending more time together and this led on to them sharing apartments and after two years they formed a duo and they only really got serious with the music in 1970 and three years after they set up the duo they did sign to Atlantic Records and release their debut album in 1972. Unfortunately, to begin with, they struggled to define their sound because of all the influences coming together, and the first three albums weren't massively successful, but they did work with well-known producers. Todd Rundgren was one of those, and I have a video on Todd here somewhere on the channel if you want to check that out independently. But Abandoned Luncheonette, their second album, had the song She's Gone on, and that was covered by Tavares, and they had a huge hit with that. It got to number one in the R&B charts in 1974 and that album as a whole did get a lot of local radio airplay and did make it to number 33 in the album charts. They then signed with RCA Records and in 1975 released the album Daryl Hall and John Oates and that had Sarah Smile on it which turned into their first top 10 hit getting to number 4 in the charts and as always happened the previous record label Atlantic then re-released She's Gone which got to number 7 in the charts because of Daryl and John now having success and being more well known Atlantic just threw that out there to try and make as much money as possible from those previous recordings but anyway in 1976 they then released Bigger Than Both of Us and this included the monster hit Rich Girl which turned into their first ever number one in the late 70s, the whole disco sound was taking off, so the albums became a little bit less successful. Also, Daryl had his first solo album, and that was called Sacred Songs, and that was produced by Robert Fripp. And the record label at the time didn't want to release it because they thought it was a little bit too experimental, but it was eventually released three years after they recorded it in 1980. In the 1980s, they felt like they weren't getting the sound they wanted in the studio, so they started to get into production themselves. They had their touring band to play in the studio as well. And they co-wrote with Sarah Allen and her younger sister. And Neil Kernan as well got involved as an engineer in the studio. And he would go on to produce their next two albums. They released Voices in 1980. And the third single from that album called Kiss on My List was a huge number one. Also, they got to number five with You Make My Dreams. And on that album was a song called Every Time You Go Away. And that was covered by Paul Young in 1985. He had a huge number one with that song. They released Private Eyes in 1981, and that was a huge album. It made it into the top 10 of the album charts. Also, they had a number one with the title track, I Can't Go For That, No Can Do. This was also a number one. They were almost consecutive number ones, but... Physical by Olivia Newton-John popped in between the release of those two songs so they didn't have consecutive number ones unfortunately because Physical was a monster hit when that was released. They also had success with Did It In A Minute that got to number nine in the charts. In 1982, they released H2O, and that turned into their most successful album, getting to number three in the charts, but selling over four million copies. Man Eater was on that album, and that was a monster hit, got to number one. One on One as well got to number seven in the charts, and they did a cover of the Mike Oldfield track Family Man, that got to number six in the charts. And at this point, they were one of the biggest pop acts in the USA. In 1983, they released Rock and Soul Part 1, and this was their first Best Of album. And Say It Isn't So got to number two in the charts. Adult Education got to number eight in the charts. And in 1984, they released Big Bam Boom. And again, a monster hit on that album.
album Out of Touch was a massive number one, as well as Method of Modern Love. They released their Live at the Apollo album in 1985 and took a break from touring at that point because they had been touring pretty much non-stop up until then. And they did perform at the 1985 Liberty concert, as we've just seen, because that's the video we've just watched, and that was to raise funds for the restoration of the Statue of Liberty. And in 1986, Daryl had a top five hit on his solo album, and the hit was called Dreamtime. He also had a top 40 hit with Foolish Pride. In 1987, they signed with Arista Records and released in 1988, Ooh Yeah! And on this album, Everything Your Heart Desires, got to number three in the charts, that was a huge hit. They also released in 1990, Change of Season, and their song So Close on that album was co-produced by Bon Jovi, and it got to number 11 in the charts. In 1997, they released Marigold Sky, and in 2003 was Do It For Love, and the title track from that album got to number three in the adult contemporary charts, so it was a huge hit in that chart. And in 2004, Our Kind of Soul was released, and that was an album made up of mostly cover songs. And in 2006, Home For Christmas was released, that's a Christmas album, obviously, and It Came Upon A Midnight Clear was a song that got to number one this time in the adult contemporary charts. In 2008, they played at the Troubadour, and this was 35 years after their first performance there, and this was released as a concert film, and the song Sarah Smile was nominated for a Grammy. They also released a Greatest Hits for CD box set in 2009, and in 2014, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Another thing to mention quickly as well is that Daryl set up his Live at Daryl's House YouTube channel in 2007, and that was from just an idea of jamming with other musicians and setting up a channel like that on YouTube. In 2014, they played in Ireland for the first time, and that was in Dublin, and in 2016, they were awarded their star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In 2017, they toured the USA with Tears for Fears, and also that year headlined Blues Fest 2017 at the O2 Arena here in London. But as well as having that top level songwriting ability, you can tell that it is all about the live performances, and that's what Daryl and John love to do, considering the fact that they've pretty much been touring throughout their whole careers. But thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep. Keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock!